In this video, I'm going to talk about five more things that you probably don't know about Newcastle. It's coming up. Number one, if Amanda Staveley and the owners of Newcastle United were going to consider building a new stadium in a few years' time, they probably can't use the town moor here because of grazing rights to cattle. <coughs> so the town moor land here sits about half a mile north of St James's Park and it's almost a thousand acres. That's bigger than Hyde Park and Central Park in New York. It's absolutely massive. And from about the 13th century, the freemen of Newcastle have had the grazing rights of their cows to, uh, to graze on the town moor here, to just to basically roam around. And that was made an act of parliament and uh, rubber stamped in 1744. So if there was any ideas and plans to build a new stadium here, they would have to get permission from the freemen of Newcastle and the chances of that are almost nil. In addition to that, with climate change wreaking havoc on the planet, towns and cities around the country are desperate to hold on to their green areas as part of becoming carbon neutral. And that's no different for Newcastle either. The Freemen of Newcastle, in conjunction with Walking for the Wounded Military Charity, have recently planted 100 saplings in the town moor as part of this green regeneration. But there's also plans to plant hundreds more trees in five different locations around the town moor in order to protect this green land. This also applies to the area over by Spittle Tongues where you have nuns and hunters moor. Um, so basically this whole area is just a no-go for any, any sort of building development as far as, I, as far as I can make out. Back in 1997, Sir John Hall had uh, ideas and plans for a super stadium by some land next to Spittle Tongues. But uh, such was the, the ferocity of the objections and protests Sir John Hall pulled out of that. So that would probably block any future idea in that same spot again. And just as a point of historical interest as well, from Spittle Tongues, down to the Rotine via Oosburn there, there's an old Victorian tunnel built around uh, the mid-1800s which was used to transport coal down to the River Tyne and it passes along the or underneath the edges of the town moor. So there you go, the town moor end of number one, it's protected land under a parliamentary act of 1744 and as opposed to the Leasers Park next to St James's Park, that's listed land and that can't be touched either. Number two, you can't build a new stadium here either at the Utility Arena which is being moved to Gated in a couple of years time or the Leadwork site just over there. So I'm still at the minute on one of the staircases at the side of the arena and behind me is the old Leadworks, uh, the Elzik Leadworks which uh, were around from about I think the late 1700s in one form or another um, until uh, recent decades when it was taken down so there's just waste land behind me. Some supporters feel that you know, why don't we build a new Newcastle United Stadium on this land here? Or the land here where the arena is, which is going to be um, decommissioned in a couple of years' time, ready for the new site on the Gated Quay side. Unfortunately, the land behind me has been developed near Mark for a large housing project of, as part of Newcastle's regeneration scheme. Like most places, Newcastle needs more housing. So there's plans in development for about a thousand new houses and a hotel on this site behind me so this site is spoken for and it, uh, it can't be used. So behind me here on the gated side of the quayside is going to be the site for the new waterfront leisure and arts development nestled in between the sage over there and the Baltic here it's a 260 million pound development that's going to see a brand new state-of-the-art 12 and a half thousand seater stadium a luxury hotel a conference centre and recreational and performance space and this is going to generate about a 2,000 jobs for the area. It'll bring in about a million tourists and generate about 60 million pound every year. Number three, a quickie. Back in 1650, saw witness to the biggest ever execution in English history. 14 witches and a wizard were hung on the town moor here. Uh, it was all the rage then, just coming to the, at the end of the English Civil War. And the 30 witches were actually housed in the Newcastle jail. That was whittled down to 14. One of them being deemed to be too pretty to be a witch, would you believe it? But anyway, they were all brought here onto the town moor. Did you hear that? Anyway, they were brought here onto the town moor and hung. And they were then taken down to the church next to Newgate and dumped in an unmarked grave. If you'd like to see more videos like this and be notified the moment I release the next one, make sure you hit the subscribe button. Number four, 
How does that sky walk up there, which is directly underneath the Tyne Bridge and behind the Newcastle Arms, just abruptly end in mid-air? So in order to answer that question, we need to go back to 1959 and the appointment of the now infamous Thomas Dan Smith to the head of Newcastle City Council. And he was a visionary. He had big plans and ideas for Newcastle City Centre. He wanted to turn it into a futuristic Brasilia of the North, a 3D city where he could anticipate and see the growing number of cars in the city centres and towns were going to cause problems with pedestrians. So he wanted to build a skywalk city, if you like, across the whole of the Newcastle city centre. That first of all crossed the central motorway here, but it would mean that pedestrians and shoppers would have a much happier shopping experience and they could walk right across Newcastle city centre without ever crossing a road. So he employed the services uh, of a town planner called Wilfred Burns. So they set about building this uh, elevated skywalk uh, footwear system across Newcastle, uh, starting off in the east end of the city centre, like I say, first of all, crossing this central motorway. And a lot of it's been built around the job John Dobson Street area, but also the top of Northumberland Street. And you'll see a little section uh, at the, the back of the now Primark building. There's these concrete little structures jutting out from the back wall. Well, those were support structures for a footpath that was never built. Unfortunately, a couple of things got on the way and the, the development was never finished. First of all, the public didn't like the system by and large, although the, the, the section that I'm stood on now is used every day and it's quite busy. Other sections uh, are really quite hidden out of sight and the public didn't feel safe using those particular footpaths. Uh, uh, there was no passive surveillance, meaning they were hidden from view. So there was some muggings and yet yeah, the public just didn't feel safe so they ran into problems there. They also eventually just ran out of money and as I said earlier on infam infamously Thomas Dan Smith was eventually convicted of corruption charges and bribery and he spent three years of a six-year prison sentence. So unfortunately as you can see now large sections of this skywalk network is run down and dilapidated and full of graffiti and it's really not a pleasant experience to walk through and that's why that bridge, that Skywalk Bridge, underneath the Tyne Bridge, behind the Newcastle Arms, hasn't been finished. Just as a little bonus, did you know, that building just over there, my left shoulder there, the Oxford, back in the day, back in like the early 80s, that used to be, it was a nightclub called Tiffany's. And on a Tuesday night, there was a 14 to 18 year old disco. And me and my mates used to get the bus over from Gated and go to the nightclub there. Great times. Number five. What exactly is a Geordie and where does the term come from? Now I could do a whole separate video for this one to try and keep it under two minutes but basically Geordie is a nickname for anybody traditionally from this area who's called George and the origins for this certainly from what I can find out go back about 300 years but I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So to start off with the term Geordie it can be described from the Oxford English Dictionary as a native or inhabitant of Tyneside or a neighbouring region of North East England or the dialect or accent of people from Tyneside, especially Newcastle. So in modern times, a Geordie is somebody from the Tyneside area, Newcastle, Gated, South Shields, Whitley Bay, you've got the Geordie Tyneside accent, you're a Geordie. And being a Geordie is especially linked with being a fan of Newcastle United. It's a term that the local people are proud of, we're proud to be a Geordie, it's got a strong identity. And the popularity of the Geordies in the Geordie region really took off probably in the late 90s, sorry, the late 80s going into the 90s with TV programmes such as Auf Wiedersehen Pet and Soldier Soldier. You had the comic Viz, which was hugely popular. It's a, a really popular place for uh, coming to visit for the nightlife. It's one of the most popular accents in Britain. St James's Park is one of the most popular stadiums to come to but also because of Newcastle United during the 90s and certainly under Kevin Keegan when we became known as the entertainers. So all of that put together really put Geordie Land on the map and was like a really popular place to come and see. But where does it come from? Well, going back into the 1800s, a Geordie was um, synonymous with being a pitman, a miner from the area because the, the Geordie miners, the miners from Tyneside and the surrounding area 
used a particular safety lamp called the Geordie lamp. And it was called a Geordie lamp because the inventor of it was called George Stevenson. Geordie being a nickname for George. Unlike the rest of the mining uh, community around the UK, they used another type of safety lamp called the Davy lamp. So that separated uh, the people of the Northeast region in the mining community. But the research I've done suggests that the term Geordie goes back even further, back to the early 1700s. And because it's a nickname of the word George, it would appear, certainly with strong anecdotal evidence, that uh, it come about when uh, England had its first king called George, which is George I. He became into power in 1714. He was the first Hanoverian king, the first German king. So he came to England and he didn't speak a word of English. And there was um, a lot of split loyalties at the time. And this was the birth of the Jacobite uprising from about 1715. The Scottish clans who wanted their own king in place. And between 1715 and ultimately 17. 45, that 30 year period up until the, Bal uh, the Battle of Culloden and this was the period of the Jacobite uprising who were dead against King George. So from about 1715 when the Jacobites were recruiting their men to join their army and, and it wasn't straightforward there were other clans who wouldn't join the Jacobites but the Jacobites came through Northumberland recruiting men from the Northumberland towns and villages to join the Jacobites so English were involved as well but Newcastle when they got to Newcastle which had a city wall at the time it shut its gates to the Jacobites of course like most things it boiled down to money and trade and Newcastle didn't want to be seen to be disloyal to King George so they shut the gates on the Jacobites uh, and that led to the Jacobites um, having a disdainful view of the, the the Newcastle people and at the time they called King George King Geordie. Its origins are a, um, a derogatory word, it wasn't a complimentary word. King Geordie and the Newcastle folk who supported King George by the Jacobites were called the Geordies. So they were gone as, uh, as broad brush as I can do it. It probably originated from the early 1700s when we had the first King George. The Jacobites would um, hurl abuse at uh, the Geordie, the Geordie folk who supported King George. And it then grew from then into the 1800s, the miners who used the Geordie lamp invented by George Stevenson. And eventually today, we're basically anybody from the Tyneside area collectively is known as the Geordies. So I hope that made sense. I haven't got a script. I haven't got a teleprompter or anything. That's off the top of my head. Uh, any questions or comments about that, just leave them below. Two, three.